Um, how will you know if you're successful? Or how will you know when you fail? Um, what resources do you need? How do you balance the needs of your newsroom? What skills and technology do you need? What effort do you need? What are the ethical and judgment issues that are involved? Because you know, we're, we're very used to all the ethics around classic storytelling. Some of these, welcome, yay. Admit it, you got up late. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> if you've got a presentation, we can come. Um, uh, you know, so some of the ethical and judgment issues that we're just sort of inventing uh, uh, right now. And then, because these are new, audiences perhaps may not be used to them. So what, what kind of education do audiences need, for that matter? What kind of education do your, do the, do your staffs at your organizations need to appreciate all of these things? So those are the areas we want to get to. But first of all, let's... Let's, uh, let's get, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Suzanne Reber from The uh, Reveal, uh, David Trevin from uh, Corrective, Juliana Rutus from Al Jazeera. There you go. Uh, Suzanne? Thank you. Reg? Oh, you've got a mic. Okay. I've got a mic. Good. Um, so. There we go. Oops. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oops. Uh, you have to keep it. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, so I'm Suzanne Reber. I'm with the Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, my present job is the executive editor of Reveal, which is a radio show and a podcast, but I won't be talking about that. That was highly innovative four years ago um, because it was the first ever radio show to do investigative reporting in, in the US. But what I want to talk to you about today is really uh, some innovations that have come out of the Center for Investigative Reporting which has been around for 40 years. It's a nonprofit investigative newsroom based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And for the whole 40 years that they've been around, they've always been kind of um, leaders in innovation. And, and so I think this is just part of the history. So what I'm gonna talk about is what happens when you actually start focusing on this question of audience. If that's one of the primary questions that you're always asking, there's a lot of things that can happen out of that. And I'm going to just talk about two examples, very recent, um, so that you can, we can get a good discussion going. Um, literally, we have a brand new tool that we're using. It is, it's so new that we've only used it four times. It, has, um, it is called Amplify. It is trying to solve a problem. Like many innovations, how do you solve the problem of when somebody's listening to the radio, how do you get them to also consume perhaps all of these wonderful digital assets that we also create, the videos, um, the documents, whatever it is that you think are relevant to your audience, because we know from all the interactions with our audience that they are actually really hungry for these things. But generally, converting somebody from one medium and say, go to our website, that just doesn't work. So Amplify uh, was a result of working through the questions of how could we do this and actually came up with this very simple SMS chatbot. The audience texts us, we text some stuff back. Not, you know, not inventing rocket science, but what's amazing is actually the conversion and we've only done a few experiments. So this is what it looks like. Um, we, give a, we give a prompt, hey, we're trying something new, text us and, um, you know, and then you will see you know, the video of our host getting dragged into uh, demonstration and jumping on front of, on top of his, um, the, the guy who was getting beaten up. This, this video, um, this is from an episode called Street Fight. This video was viral on the internet. It was one of our most listened to episodes to date, like, you know, of our numbers that we have. Um, and the little experiment we did that day, um, and this, by the way, keeps working even after, um, even after the episode's gone. So in time, if you were to go download that episode and follow the prompt and text that message, you will still get the interaction. Um, sorry. Um, so that's Amplify, and we'll talk more about that. That's the interactive uh, text bot, SMS bot. The other thing, it's, it's been around now four seasons, so it's a little bit more baked into our system. Um, it's called StoryWorks. Some of you in the audience have actually heard me talk about it, but 
It is um, investigative theater. So what we do is it, we call it the intersection between investigative reporting and theater or the sort of emotional experience of investigative reporting. And uh, it, is, it is based on all of our investigative techniques and it's held to a very high standard, which we'll talk about in our discussion, but I just want to show you a little bit about what it looks like for the audience. the idea. Um, so it's a, it's a play, but it's an investigation. Um, we've been doing it for four seasons, two to three a year, um, and it's just something that has kind of exploded for us in terms of people wanting to talk to us about it. And it's, uh, it's constantly evolving, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the development of where we went from the beginning to the end when we talk in our conversation, the most recent play we did really tested our model because we actually worked with the community and rather than um, doing an investigation and then writing a play, we actually initiated an, a, a play from the ground up inside uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. It's a very important town in the civil rights movement. And we created a, a, a play around a historical figure called Vera Mae Piggy that you can see in the image there. Um, that has hardly ever been uh, talked about. People don't know about this woman. And we're really going back to the past to examine uh, the sort of roots uh, of some of the uh, racial tensions that we're reliving re right as, as we speak. And uh, I can talk to you a little bit about why that was a different way of doing it. And that's my speed round. So, uh, my name is David Schraven. I'm with Korrektiv. That's a German um, uh, non-profit newsroom. And I would like to introduce to you um, three stories we did where we find some new stuff in it. First, we made a story on uh, right-wing terrorist groups. And it was a long investigation, took us a long time. And then we had to decide whether we do it again as the 1,000 line story that a couple of people will read. Um, but then we couldn't reach out to a new audience. And we thought, OK, we do a graphic novel on it. And it was um, yeah, quite successful. We could show a lot of uh, things that happened in the past. We could make it visible to people so that they could better understand what was happening. And it became a bestseller, which is for a nonprofit newsroom also quite good. We earned a lot of money with it. And second is, um, afterwards, we made an exhibition out of this uh, graphic novel and sent this exhibition all over the country. It was in more than 50 cities in Germany. And 
always again and again and again it become a new discussion. If we had done it only as a, a re regular story you do, you know, then it's published once, people read it and forget about it. So we had this story in people's mind for over two years. That's, from my point of view, quite okay. Um, the next thing um, I would like to introduce to you is something we call a mobile newsroom. Um, we had a scandal in the town of Bottrop. It's in the mining town in, in Germany, which is, yeah, quite underreported. Uh, most journalists in Germany are in the capital, as all over the world, but not in the mining districts. And there was a big uh, medicine scandal, and it was completely underreported. And we said, okay, if there's a scandal in this town, we moved to this town, we rented a shop, um, we brought the witnesses, and didn't quote them only, but we let them talk to the people, and there showed up hundreds of people to our reportings, and it's a quite different approach. When you have the people there, you can talk to. When you have the quotes, not only as quotes, but as real people talking to other people, that was a big experience. And next thing I would like to show to you is also a theater. We did it the same as a theater, um, but in our case, it was a data story we did, and we would like to show people as an, uh, a play. Oh. Oh, yes. Um, and the data story usually are quite, everybody knows how to click some stuff, but we thought of another way to present such a data story. And we made it a play. We let people, a reporter, explain what he experienced over the time. And it was very successful from, for Germany. It was shown first in another mining town in Dortmund, and then it became quite popular and went up to Berlin to one of the most famous theaters in Germany, uh, Berliner Ensemble. Um, when you see this, you think, okay, this is only one stuff that was done on this issue. But it was not only this one, what you see right now, what I showed to you. We also did classical reporting on the same issues. In, in the mobile uh, newsroom, for example, we published um, almost 100 stories, I guess, right now. Uh, or on this issue with the data set that I showed to you, it was also big reporting, it was half a book of it. And yeah, my experience from all of this is um, we need to keep our mind open to reach out to new audiences or to audiences in, in new ways so they like to understand what they see, so they talk about what they see, so they reach out to other people. And it's not only about social media and the internet, it's also about communication in ordinary communities, and this is the way you can get it. Okay, so I'm praying that the PowerPoint works. Um, so, my name is Juliana Ruthers. I'm a journalist with Al Jazeera, and specifically, I work on the People in Power strand, where I make 25-minute uh, investigations and documentaries. So, I'm a journalist and filmmaker by training. Um, but one of the big concerns is that um, uh, that what we do uh, quite often doesn't reach new and younger audiences. Okay, oops, there you go. Oops. Um, so, so I'm very interested in playing around with new formats to see if that way we can um, get to new audiences like um, the others. Uh, and I also think that uh, interactivity particularly lends itself uh, to, to be mixed with investigative journalism. So that the whole idea of investigative journalism, we gather clues, we collate evidence, uh, that that is something uh, that we can pass on through interactivity. And what's quite interesting about being here, that we're actually not so much talking about virtual reality, that's what I get all the time. And I feel like that's um, journalism that is driven by technology. I think all of us are very much editorial thinkers, and that's certainly at the heart of uh, my projects. Um, but now you've got to come back because I've got the big screen and I do that there. Okay, so that's what I just said. Take it out of the ivory tower. Okay, so the first project that I did that some of you might have seen uh, was based on a film that I made in Sierra Leone, which was um, an investigation into illegal fishing. Uh, and it, it was a really brilliantly lucky investigation. We sort of filmed the crime in the beginning and then caught the culprits in the end. And we turned it into an interactive project um, where we showed the clips, um, that, uh, some of the footage from the film, um, but we also brought up little icons every time we gathered evidence. 
and that at the end of each clip, you could see the evidence and you could click on it. And then we asked the user, we, we told you why it was important, and then we asked the user to drag and drop it into an investigative notebook, which is on the right, and the user had to decide whether it was criminal evidence, uh, because that's, of course, what we all have to do. A lot of us have to answer to lawyers before we publish, or other forms of evidence. So that was really the first experiment with gamification. Um, and we also had virtual uh, environments in, in the storytelling where the user uh, could decide where to go, but the big challenge was to give the user freedom whilst maintaining control over the narrative. And I think that's the key problem with interactivity. Um, and one of my frustrations with that, okay, so we got people to drag and drop the evidence, but I felt that the click did not have a consequence. The user's click did not change the outcome of the story. So from then on, I, I knew that the next project I wanted to do is something where the click had a consequence. Um, and then again, I mean, I'm really also very much interested in, in, in reversioning, which used to be such a dirty word. But if I make a film already, how can I use that content? We already have to publish online and write, but can I also make it interactive? So this was uh, a film about the Syrian cyber war, um, where we investigated how hacking was changing the conflict, how activists were tortured to reveal their passwords, how battles were being hacked, uh, and, and the hacking changed the outcome of battles. And then we converted that film into, into that, because some of the response from the previous project was that people wanted to consume journalism on their mobile phones, um, so also chat-based. Um, so uh, interesting that you're looking at chat as well. Uh, can the users click? So, so then how can we build in decisions uh, sorry, no, first thing, interviews and chat format. Uh, so you talk to the little chat heads at the top, um, but we send you videos from Anonymous. Um, the one in the middle is where the Syrian Electronic Army, the pro asset hackers, ask you to vote, um, which is a real thing. Everything in that is real, what to hack next. You can jump between different interviewees. Um, and we also have video where you can um, ask the questions that you want to ask. Um, this is a video interview with a hacker. Um, so, first set of user decision, decisions based on journalism craft, um, where you ask, for example, can you interview somebody not showing the face? Yes, if you've checked them out and you need to keep them safe. No, you cannot pay a black hacker and those decisions, um, which some people would probably be tempted to do, but affect the outcome of your story. Second set of decision, information security, keep yourself and your interviewee safe. Um, connect to VPN, if you lose time, but if you don't do it, you lose an interviewee, um, update all the time, and also don't fall for a blackmail hack. So all these examples are real hacks from the Syrian cyber war. Uh, that I can speak about that later. The people that I built it with, they kept on wanting to invent stuff, which was really creative. I kept on saying, if it didn't happen, it's not journalism, it doesn't go in. Um, so then the extra challenge was investigate hacking without getting hacked. Um, so we used all these real life examples from the cyber war. And so the really brilliant thing um, was, yeah, it's immersive, it's personalized, but is it the right slide? No, not yet. Anyway, yeah, that's the thing that attracts me about this sort of ex uh, interactivity. You don't just tell the story, but if you say to the user of this project, investigate hacking without getting hacked, it's the format of of, of the project that tells the story as much as the content. Because they, and, and yeah, I can talk about some unexpected outcomes, um, positive and negative at the end. Um, I just want you to see that because that's what I'm gonna refer to. That's another interactive notebook because we had a lot of problems with, is it real? Do people accept it as journalism? And we decided to build that as a reference point if people wanted to go back to it. And I'm also going to speak about user testing and um, we had, big gigantic touch screens um, uh, at, a, at, at several festivals and it was really amazing to do user testing that way because you know where people get lost, um, you see your age group, all sorts of things. And I'm now working on a Google project, Google funded project, which also is chat based and which is hopefully a newsroom tool for other journalists how, where they can, um, when we launch in spring, uh, use their, take their stories that they've already done and convert it into an interactive chat project so that they have that, that users, I'm rushing because we've all got five minutes. I'll speak more about that if anybody interested later, um, but where they can basically generate
generic news tool for what we've done. So, um, so we thought that we, we have a whole range of things that uh, that we that we wanted to sort of discuss, um, and you know, so we want to get a chance to go talk through those things. Then obviously we'll open it up. But I guess the first thing really is, where do you get ideas from, and or how do you encourage people in newsrooms, some of whom may not be the most innovative people in the world, um, to you know to come up with ideas and to be open with ideas, um, you know, at the same time sort of having some real sort of rigor to, to, uh, to evaluating whether they're worthwhile or not. Suzanne, you wanna? Well, I think it's interesting for me to have entered an environment that was already incredibly open to uh, involving a lot of people in the newsroom are able to participate in new ideas. And it's like joining CIR is like, like a fire hose is coming at you. As soon as you join there, you're bringing your skills, which in my case was you know, being an investigative editor, having done radio, television, different languages, that kind of thing, open to innovation, but maybe hadn't even really done some of these crazy things. But the thing I, I, I want to say is you have to allow those discussions to happen. And if you are always focused on just the primary output and everything is about the deadline, and I think that's where legacy organizations sometimes get themselves in trouble, they think of innovation as sort of over there, right? It has to be baked into the conversations all the time. And if you are constantly asking that question about what is our audience? Who's being harmed? Who are we trying to communicate with? That's, that's the word, communicate with. The, the conversation changes. So I think that's kind of how the ideas come because the questions drive the ideas or the problems drive the ideas. We have a problem, why won't people Go and look at our cool shit, you know? We need them to look. How could we make that happen? That's how the Amplify thing started. David? Yeah, I think you're right. It's all about um, uh, the environment in the newsroom, so you can start something. And what I think is important for something like this is when you not think of a journalist as somebody who is talking over other people, who's like a helicopter coming in and co going out to a story. But when you want to have, um, how is it called in Germany? We say um, Augenhöhe, eye height. Um, eye to eye. Uh, if what? Eye, if you're eye to eye. If you're eye to eye, then it's uh, then you search for other ways to tell your story, because some people, when we did the story in Botrop, you know, the mining district, there were a lot of quite simple people. You need to change your language. You need to uh, do s other stuff. Suddenly you notice, oh, I need to do more on service um, information not uh, so much on investigations. Investigation is also important, but you need to be clear and uh, open-minded. So you think of, ah, maybe, you know, I just call in the witnesses, I let them talk. And this is something different. I, I think the eye hire is very important. And the second thing is that you always think of, okay, we are a part of our audience and we need to reach out to the parts of our audience we would, we would like to be with. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, we're, we're, we're all passionate about our content. So the question is, you know, how can we really make sure that people see that? I think I'm in a slightly different position from you two because you're editors and I'm a filmmaker, so I have to pitch. <laughs> I have to sell it internally. I'm not the decision maker. Um, so I pitch the same way that, um, that, that I pitch for a film. The idea has to be good. I have to demonstrate it. I have to convince my bosses, and that doesn't always work. It gets easier when you've done something um, and, and it's been successful. But um, I, I think we're all so concerned about new audiences and there is no, no fixed solution. I think we just have to experiment and then look to the feed, at the feedback and learn from our mistakes. And for that reason, I also try and do projects, A, that reversion content that is already out there so that you don't have the same news gathering or research project all the time. And also, I, I try and make it cheap purposefully um, because I, I want it to be replicable. And if I get it wrong, I, I want to be able to do the next better thing very quickly. And I also appreciate that not everybody has money. A lot of the projects that I've seen are very, very, very costly. And that's not really the real world of journalism. You're talking to the man who blew a million bucks and protected <laughs> China. So, um, yeah. 
I would like to add one thing. Um, I think what was very important is to have a real pitch process. So it's not just somebody is telling, uh, I would like to do that or this. But um, in our newsroom, it's like this. We invite reporters, if they want to do something, to pitch it in the, uh, in the whole newsroom. It's a special meeting. People come in, and then we discuss over it. And after the pitch meeting, when it's processed, not one people is working on it, but a couple of people are working on it. And then we have another meeting afterwards and ask for, OK, where's the real relevance? What should we really do? And then you have more people in the whole process, and you can do much better work. So, so I wanted to follow up on that and, and really talk about what's the purpose of any individual format, right? And what, what are you trying to achieve? How do, you, how do you sort of frame that, sell it, or sell it internally? Um, and then how do, you, you know, how do you think about the measurements you need to know that you're being successful or, or whether you should kill it because it's not going, going very far? Um, so I guess I'll, <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about StoryWorks, which is the theater project that, you know, we've, we have been gathering kind of evidence about that for about, you know, four years. It, it, it came again from, a, from, from this desire to, to really connect with, the, with an audience and hear the actual kind of interaction, uh, as David said, of what, what is, how do we bring these stories to life? How do, how do you actually get feedback from, from real people uh, interacting with these investigations? You can't do that uh, easily. Um, with with StoryWorks, it is, it is limited. I mean, we have not yet done the big, you know, been in New York, even though we've had people say, you should bring your play to New York. Going into a theater, 400 uh, seats or even more, is a very different experience. A black box theater, which is what we tend to use, 100 to, to maybe 200 max, changes the nature of the conversation, and we are aiming for an intimate experience. But by the time we go through a run like that, we still potentially have connected with 1,000 or 2,000 people, and we're having act one is the play, Act two is the conversation, the actual conversation with the audience. We let them ask the questions. We have sources on the stage. We have the playwright. We have the reporters. Uh, and they ask th the most amazing questions. That informs not just our experience of, you know, well, how does the consumer, how does the audience react to investigative news, but what really matters to them? So it's an exchange. They're learning about these incredible issues in real time. These are very topical things. The playwright gets something out of it because they are generally not encouraged to write fast, whereas we ask them to write fast. So it really is that desire and hunger to have that real conversation. And you would be amazed. And of course, it's incredibly emotional. You're having, you're, you know, we are having an experience along with the audience that informs our reporting and, and our creative processes in more than just the plays. Um, when I would talk about impact, I would love to talk about this mobile newsroom. Um, there was a big problem in the city with healthcare, and it was underreported, and then people lost trust in, in the news in this town. They lost the trust in the authorities in the town, and it was like a separated people. And when we moved in there and started reporting there with them, they met at our office. They met in front of our office, as you saw. And then they were talking about solutions. What can we change? What could be different? What laws should be changed? And then there was, after uh, two months that we were worked there, there were like, um, what is Forderung? Forderung? Forderung and challenge? Like no. Uh, demands. F five demands. It was like five demands. Everybody agreed on what needs to be changed. And uh, when they had these demands, suddenly they had a way to go. You know, They knew what they wanted to do. It was nothing that we uh, said, okay, you must um, demand that. They developed that. And uh, after that, we as journalists were more or less like moderators. And they gained again trust. They gained again trust that they can change something, that they can do something. And this town is very small. And when you have like in a small town uh, one or two thousand people um, uh, working with you, that it's like you're changing something. And this is an impact... Okay, the demands are not fulfilled yet, but we hope for it. Yeah, that's really interesting because I'm so obviously aiming for the digital space and I'm sort of slightly <laughs> jealous that you're in direct dialogue. Um, but I'm really, I guess my goal is to get into people's social media and because I'm working for a global broadcaster, 
um, th that's what I'm aiming for. Um, I think the, the concept of empowerment is important to me because I think if you reveal, for example, the process of evidence gathering, that is potentially empowering. And like one of the surprise successes was that both projects get uh, used quite a lot in schools. Mm. So the pirate fishing project uh, to teach journalism and then the, the thing that I never, I didn't expect that, but what I expected even less is now that the Syrian hack project is being used to, um, to teach uh, security, online security at A level by some teachers in the UK, which is brilliant because I can slip them a film about Syria and, um, and, and that's really sort of my goal in putting the journalism out there to get people who are not the normal audiences engaged and, and if that works via schools, that's brilliant. And um, the other thing that happened when we launched and maybe this is also, I, I think if you do these digital projects, you really have to think about where they live and how much money, money you need for marketing them. And that's really a substantial amount because you can create the most amazing thing and then nobody gets to see it. So in theory, you need commitment behind you of, of, of your broadcaster pushing it and, and social media producers because if you are aiming at the digital space, um, you have to make it known. And we got pick up in games public publications such as Gamer Sutra, um, and sort of, yeah, just people who don't normally engage with news. So, so that, that, that was great. Uh, so, so you touched on resources and things that you need, which, which I wanted to, mm. to get to as well. Beyond just sort of straight up resources, right? Your time, your time, your time. Um, you obviously need some skills that don't exist in newsrooms. You need illustrators, you need um, playwrights, you need people who can do staging, costume design, you need developers. How do you get those things in the newsroom or, or how do you you know, how, how do you manage to get people's time to do these things in the newsroom? You wanna? Yeah, I mean, I've got an understanding with my boss that I get to do these things if it doesn't really impact my day job, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is filmmaking, so. But just one salary. <laughs> yeah, so I, actually the reality is that I spend, uh, you know, it does affect my day job at times, but I also spend a lot of times in the evenings and weekends working on this, that is the reality. Um, and because I tend to, when I make films, work with independent producers who come in and we collaborate, that is also was for me very obviously the, the model for my projects. Um, and actually, you know, when you say, how do we have ideas, um, both these projects, uh, and well, the third one was a bit more me, but uh, the one in the making now, but they came out of conversations and they came out of discussing what was already out there, the early days of WebDoc, and then saying, Um, what I try to do is um, always find partners. You know, when we do theater, we are not experts in theater, so I convince somebody in theater to work with us. Um, or when it comes to uh, graphic novels, then we are looking for people who can make graphic novels. And then I start to find resources for them that they get paid. This is what we do. And, uh, yeah. Um, it's... It's interesting, I think, again, going back to that little incubator model, CIR, having done lots of stuff in, in the past, um, there's an openness there of, of, of a collaborative approach. So what happens sometimes is you, you, you have these serendipitous moments. You know, you have, uh, in the case of Jenna Wells, she's the director of StoryWorks, she already knew about CIR. Um, she met Joaquin, who is, who is who is our former CEO, we're always out there. I mean, you know, I'm here, there are other uh, staffers who go to things, we're always out there talking to people about the work, and then we're meeting people and they say, hey, can I come visit? David's been to CIR. There's a sort of an exchange going on, um, and the, the director uh, was very interested in, in, in the work, and, and it was from a place that we hadn't thought about. It's like, do you realize how important it is uh, what you're doing, and we can never get that into the theater because it takes three years to do a production. What if we did something together? It usually starts with, hey, let's dance, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's about the, the partners knowing who's doing other innovative stuff. So, you know, when we had the chatbot uh, idea, the idea of like, how can we communicate with the audience? Well, the D school at Stanford is like down the road, if you like. You, you're looking for where can I go and mix it up with people. That, that, is, that is something that's part of your constant thinking and of course meeting people and actually following up and actually asking for their expertise and so it's an exchange. 
And, and I think it comes from that hunger to always test the boundaries. When I was still at CBC, which is many years ago, um, I was only doing investigations. I wasn't able to do all these things. But we did have a very small team, and the way that we tried to encourage ourselves is we made a pact. Every time we do a project, we are going to make it harder. What would make it harder? So working with data when it was brand new, nobody knew how to do it. Okay, we need to go to NICAR. Uh, you know, this seems like not that hard, but it is actually a process of forcing yourself to constantly evolve and learn and be willing to be scared and maybe fall down and try something. I, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a great way to describe it. I, I do want to just follow up a little bit because even though it's great that you managed to essentially get outside additional resources coming, it still takes up your, your brain space, still takes up your time, right? Every project you do is one less something else. It might be one less investigation, might be one less story. Clearly, you've made the decisions here that these are worthwhile. I mean, your nights and evenings could be spent doing another story if you wanted. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about how you, how you either make that decision in your head that this is worthwhile, or how you manage to convince your boss that this is worthwhile? You want me to? OK. Uh, I, guess I do actually think that that is the toughest question that you've asked. Because I can ask tougher ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think because I, I would say sometimes you have to try something uh, for a while to eat. You, I, I really do believe you, you, you need a little bit of experience to try stuff. And I think a lot of times people kill it before it's even started. That would be my observation. Um, and of course, we actually ran two projects. One of them I led. Uh, at the time that StoryWorks began, we were also doing a project we called Off Page. It was an attempt to get really investigative material in front of very young audiences, working with youth and slam poetry because that's a, it's an incredibly engaged group of young people all over the world who communicate through slam poetry. We did that. It was actually successful. We had thousands of kids engaged with investigations, but we actually ended up choosing mm -hmm. the, the place. Now, I don't know how scientific that ended up being, but it was that we could see that we weren't necessarily moving it forward and what was happening is it was a sort of, everything would be kind of repeating. Like every new group we were having to train and, and we, we, we were sort of having trouble figuring out how to scale it. And so we, we said, you know, that was great. We had fun. We're, we're gonna actually keep building out story work. So we did make a choice um, and, and now, uh, but you know, it's not, I, I don't think it's a science, I don't know how you would, necessarily say is, is, is it uh, what's more worthwhile in the long run? I don't, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. David is, though. <laughs> the CEO, maybe. <laughs> he is no. the CEO. <laughs> no, what, 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 what we do in our newsroom, or what I do very often, is just to think of what is the real question. What is the real question I want to answer to? For example, now we see in Germany and all over Europe a real rise of right-wing populism, and this is a threat our society and then I want to do something about it I don't want to accept it and then I think okay what is the real question that everybody concerns I'm I'm pretty sure from the experience from my from my places where I came from that people are not so against um, uh, uh, foreigners or something else they are against change and others this is a problem but why are they against change and others and when you start thinking about it then you see something real life problems um, what I notice right now, housing is one of the most important problems in Germany. So when we answer the question to the housing problem, then we will have an answer um, to the right-wing problem. This is the way we can uh, tackle them. We can change something about them. And then I think about, okay, what is the biggest problem in housing? Then I see, okay, interest rates are quite low. So money is flowing in from uh, the, the, um, from the uh, Börsen. What has the Börse? from the stock exchange uh, to housing markets. So people can't pay and afford their houses because people from the stock exchange need to make their interest now in housing. And what is that what we as journalists can do about it? We can search for these guys. We can see who are these guys. 
And okay, you can do it for one city, you can do it for example, but I want to do it for every city. That means I need to change the law for, for the registration of the housing all over Germany. How do I do it? And this is the way I do it. I need one town, one big town. I open up there everything, like every house I want to know who belongs to. Then I go to the next town, do it there the same way. And then I answer the question to whom Germany belongs to. And then from this point, I start to think of formats. I start to think of how do I do it, with whom I need to cooperate. But when I have such a strong question, then everything else will fall in place. Something will be good, we will prolong, something will be bad. We will say, okay, we don't care about it. But we need to find the questions and then a way to answer the question. I really appreciate that, actually. I um, think that's really great. Um, with me, it's more that, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a staff reporter, so I have certain projects. For example, earlier on this year, um, I made a film in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean because Trinidad and Tobago happens to have the highest number of ISIS recruits in the Western Hemisphere. Now, I'm not going to gamify that. Um, that's pretty clear. So I look for films that I make anyhow for Al Jazeera uh, and think how and where can I think of a new format. And I think I was just sort of very lucky that um, the first commissioning editor bought into the idea of, of making the process of evidence gathering interactive. And since then, it's really become a process of learning for me. What, what do I think we have done well in a project? And where is it taking me now? So this whole thing about making the click matter. And sometimes you also learn the wrong lessons because when we did pirate fishing, everybody told us, you've got to make it mobile. I want to see it on the mobile. And then when we, we did hacked um, for mobile phones. And when we actually um, looked at the user behavior, the majority of people had looked at it on desktops. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's that, you know, I mean, you, you have to prepare to reinvent. And I think also maybe we're just coming out of it, but um, there was a time w where, where you could absolutely make mistakes because there is still so much new and I want to exploit this time like before everybody does really cool stuff and when I get it wrong, it doesn't work. Because I think we have to learn from our mistakes and assess what works um, and, and, and what doesn't work. And, and, and we have to, I, I feel, accept sleepless nights because each of these projects I suddenly felt so out of my depth because there's something in terms of the storytelling I didn't anticipate and then I was confronted with a, a dispute over technology that I had to manage that I really did not understand. So, um, yeah, it's about being out of depth as well. And, and let me sort of both follow on that and, and pivot off that a little bit and talk about the, some of the ethical issues that you have to deal with. Uh, you know, and again, we're very used to stories told in a certain form, photos can be adjusted so much and not any more than that. And here we've got you know, actors on a stage. Did, they, did the people really talk that way? Did they really look that way? Um, you've got illustrators who are, draw, you know, did it really look that way? And then of course you've got your issue with, uh, with, with interviewers being used in a very different context. So do you talk about the process of thinking about all these things? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll get to that. I want to add one quick thing about the reason I was trying to think about, you know, why did we pick StoryWorks? The, the, the play that I showed you, the Bakken, um, the, that is a story of an investigation into the r amazing uh, uh, amount of worker deaths in the Bakken oil fields that span the, you know, U.S. and Canada. And, and it's a national story, and it's, it's something where we all put gas in our car. We don't tend to think about what happens to these oil workers. When we did that play, we wanted to actually take it to the community. So it was premiered in North Dakota, in multiple cities in North Dakota. So you can pretty well imagine what you're doing is taking it right to the heart of the people that are going to be most pissed with you, and that was deliberate. What happens there is a conversation that's challenging you and your reporting, forcing you to answer for it, and I think it informs. So all the reporters who've now been through some of these processes are, are getting that information. They are learning that a story isn't a, a, a sort of static thing. Somebody's going to react to it. They're going to have questions. They want to know. So I think that's kind of why we picked that one. Um, to, to answer your question about the, the ethics, so for the, the plays, they are based on 
the transcript. So when you saw Jesse, who was a survivor, um, talking in that play that I showed you, he has those gloves on. Those gloves he has to wear because if he doesn't wear them, he gets kind of PTSD reactions from that because his hands were burned when he went and helped his friends, some of whom passed away. So those gloves are actually the real Jesse's gloves because he was so moved by the first performance that he gave his gloves to the actor and we use them in all the performances. Um, so that, when you heard him doing his monologue, that is the interview with Jesse. Um, we of course knew that there was depositions because there were lawsuits and all of the standard things that we've done for the investigation, which also was a radio show and was a, you know, a film and all these other things CIR does. But when, by the time it became the play, um, those, those important monologues are absolutely based on the evidence. Uh, the lawyer is vetting every word. In fact, I think it's even more important to never screw it up in a different storytelling format because you're asking more of the audience. You're asking more of the journalists. Um, so we, it's, it's forcing us to test uh, our material in more than one way. And we, we have to immunize against, you know, getting attacked. And actually, uh, because we went right into the heart of the, of the Bakken, um, that we, d we actually went back and looked at it again. And, sa and the other thing is, the script is not static. Mm. We, and that's why it's so great to work with people who are up for this. So whether it's the playwrights or the actors, we are picking carefully people who are w open to a slightly crazy thing because we are sometimes changing the script right up to performance because we have to make sure we don't mess it up. What I think is important when you talk about, for example, about graphic novels, um, you don't make it up, you know. It's not, uh, the, the story is true, what you report is true, but um, you show people it's not a photograph, you know. You show people this is, this is kind of artwork. And when you have it as kind of artwork, and everybody recognizes these images as kind of artwork, then they understand, okay, um, it's an interpretation of what is the real truth, and um, it adds li layers um, to, you, to your storytelling. Um, when you just write a story, you have one layer, then you have uh, illustration, second layer, then you have uh, the colors, third layer, then you have got uh, dark and light, next um, layer, and then you have every point in this uh, illustrations is there because it has to be there. It's not by, uh, by mistake or random. So everything you can use to tell your story in a better way. And for me, it, it's like, um, like um, I don't know, as a journalist, as a usual journalist who writes, you play the pipe. When you start working with the graphic novel, then you already have like four piano is added and some other stuff is added. And when you start to do a, a theater play, you have a full orchestra. You can play every emotion you want to play it. Um, uh, we, we, we had a lot of challenges. Um, I, I think so, so the main goal was to make uh, the hack project as interactive as possible um, and, 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 and to have all the decisions. And, and, and the more we made it interactive or we kind of worked on the interactivity uh, and it suddenly there was a point where everything was still real because we used the interview context, we checked of everything was from transcripts, the hacks were real, um, the text and the blackmail hack came from a court document, but all the interactions suddenly made it seem like a game, and that really had me sleepless, because even though everything in it was real, um, the format um, made it seem unreal. So the question was, how do we backpedal uh, from that? And that's why I wanted to throw up the notebook very quickly, because one of the things that we did um, is create this notebook again where people could go and, and, and check um, who the characters are, get a biography. Um, we also, yep, that's, that's where it is. That's kind of where a lot of context sit. We also um, started drop, having drop-down notifications in which we reminded people that the content was real. Uh, and it led to quite a lot of redesign. And, and that was one of the things I hadn't anticipated, that the interactivity may, would make it feel so. Unreal. And then the challenges of collaboration as well, because I 
worked um, with a tech team and, and, and not really that much a storytelling team. And I found that in all my projects is finding a shared language because I literally lacked the vocabulary for some of this. Um, and, and they were getting so excited about hacks and, and, and social engineering. And um, I, I kept on being the fascist and saying, if it hasn't happened in real life and if it wasn't part of Syrian cyber war, we can't do it because we are Al Jazeera. It has to be real. If this lives on our news website and people feel misled about what we're doing, there is reputational damage. I mean, you know, I, I feel awful. And then just quickly, this, so I've, I, and that kept me sleepless as well. Am I producing something that my bosses will look at and say, oh my God, we can't put this on our website. What have you done? Um, and then thirdly, um, the issue of consent that you mentioned. Um, I actually, and, and I mean, I could talk also a lot about user testing. I think really when you do this sort of thing, the, the people that you work with, whether it's your audience or the people you've interviewed, become much more active in your creative process. So quite early on, I went back to, to all the people who'd been in my film because I felt even though I had an interview release for a film, I was creating a new format that, I mean, and it is pretty, I, you know, I, I don't think there is anything like that out there. So, you know, have I actually got a release from somebody if they haven't thought about how I might use the material? Plus, because I've got a lot of Syrians in it, I was also petrified that they're saying, you're doing what? You're doing something about the war in Syria that looks like that. And so I spoke to people very early on about the project and I actually went through a whole new process of getting consent to the interviews. Um, I, which you're told normally never to do in, in journalism, but I actually send it to them before publication because I felt that is the only way I could be fair, um, you know, to, to, to really have their consent. I, I was to say, I, I, could, I, could, I could ask you questions for ages, but Suzanne has to run in five minutes, so I thought I should get some questions out here quickly uh, before you have to go. Um, hi, um, I'm from Politico Europe. My name is Giulia Paravicini. How do you convince your editor to do something slightly more innovative if you work for a publication that A, links every new project to immediate stream of revenue, and B, doesn't really care about innovation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear Hold you loud punches. and clear, That's actually. Um, I mean, one of the things is I, I try. I really try. I try with my story. It's a pitching process, and sometimes I feel my head is bloody from trying and until something sticks. I think we had a moment in time with pirate fishing and then we were very lucky um, that it did quite well and won some awards. And, and, and again, I'm deliberately cheap. Um, and I work a lot with people who, who are sort of younger and the Italians who did pirate fishing who are based in Rome, Altera, they really gave their everything. They, they saw it as an opportunity and um, they were also up at the weekend and at night. So I think it takes that sort of mindset if you want to do it. Um, so, so the second project became, a, and also, I mean, I guess what I, I don't know if I said the figure, but we found with pirate fishing, 83% um, of uh, users of pirate fishing had never uh, before been on an Al Jazeera website. So that figure, I just <laughs> kept on throwing it around the conversation and I think I've become, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't like people talking about their successes, but I've become more strategic within the organization um, highlighting su successes of a project. But you can also come to me afterwards because it is... is um, should I just take another question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you have one for me, because I got to go. Sorry, I just, can you just say the last part again? Are you talking about the plays or the Amplify? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about that I love about collaboration is the is just the incredible learning that goes on in that exchange, and it's about respect. I mean, you have to respect what the other party is bringing to it. So, I'm not telling Jenna Welsh how to direct a play. Um, 
I'm waiting for her. We are now at the point after four seasons where the connection between the editorial, the legal, all these things that we had to sort of teach ourselves as a team are becoming much more fluid. So now we're sort of having joint language, right? But you, you have to have the respect. They know how to do something. They're the expert on the play stuff. Well, you are not the actor. And I think that that's a temptation sometimes, especially for the younger reporters who, who are having to see their story turn into this other thing, that they're trying to then suddenly be the boss of the whole thing. And you have to manage that as the leader. You have to say, look, you're going to wait till Jenna asks you for notes. Um, and, and you, so the leadership has to help that process, right? And you have to, I think, lead by example. So, so we've sort of figured that part out. In terms of um, the Amplify, obviously, again, you know, you, you try and work with people who know how to build a chat bot. I mean, you know, that's not how, how I, I don't. But then we actually got our team, did a lot of, um, they went out and did some field testing and focus groups before we kind of implemented it. And now, of course, we're testing it. So it, it's a, I think respect is the, the primary word I would use. And so thank you very much for your attention. I'm so sorry, but if I don't go, I'm going to miss my plane. Thank you. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk a bit about learning how to deal with other, you know, other types of you know, dealing with graphic artists, uh, with artists or dealing with developers, and learning the language of each other? I, I just want to, uh, what she said is completely right. I just want to add one thing. Um, you need time, and um, you need to, uh, when we do graphic novels, for example, there are two approaches to it. One is uh, invite the artist to the newsroom, so he's working like an editor in the newsroom the whole time and is inside the investigation all the time. Or go to an island. These are the two options. I think you were just saying about how to work with each other. Or people whose language is Yeah, I, I mean... I, I, I try and do that a, a lot anyway. I think, the, I think ultimately the people that I, I like to work with and therefore choose, that we are all in it to learn from each other. Um, and I would not tr hire somebody who's not prepared to learn from me. And it is an absolute given that I work with them um, because I'm also, I'm now using Trello and doing agile workflow stuff, which you know I never thought I would. Um, and so I think, you, you have to deliberately make time to, to understand each other. So a, a conversation that I would have with an editor for a film that would be really quick is, is going to be much longer. And also, I mean, this again was, was a thing in the hack project because like for a while we, we couldn't really um, figure out what was wrong and, and, and none of us could. And um, I had met this absolutely amazing game student because as part of the, I, again, I user tested the idea before we even drew wireframes. And in the National Film and Television School, there just was this guy that stood out, a game student. And, and there was something that felt wrong about the whole hack project, but the guys I was working with couldn't figure it out, I couldn't figure it out. So um, I, I paid him um, to sit with me two days and go through the project, and he taught me about um, in-game in, in, in and out-of-game in, in out language. Um, and this might sound really boring, but conceptually it was super important. It basically mean, meant that everything that is in the chat bubbles is only ever journalism and interview, and anything that is instructions and rules and teaches people how to interact with the project is in a drop down notification and we had inadvertently sort of mixed it up some of it and but I couldn't crack that on my own but this game student he was just on it so I sat with him for two days and we re-scripted and just pulled some stuff out and said okay that's a notification that's part of the interview stuff which for me was amazing because it's now kind of informs a lot of other stuff hi I'm Sonia Sarkar from uh, Telegraph newspaper in India I have a question for Juliana how do you tell the same story differently year after year? I'll give you an example. Like there's a, a northeastern state uh, called Assam in India, which gets flooded every year. Now, as a reporter, when I suggest stories that, mm. okay, I'll go there and do stories, my editor's question is, what is the surprise element in the story? It gets flooded every year. So what is new to this year? So how do you tell these stories differently when the event more or less is the same? Say for a, from a refugee camp, like we have these Rohingyas uh, in India, which our government doesn't want, uh, you know, doesn't want them anymore. So 
they want them to go back. But we have told these stories uh, repeatedly. So how do we tell these stories differently again? Thank you. I mean, I think I do what, what a lot of journalists do, and like, for example, the, the, with the Syrian cyber war, I, I really wanted to tell a story about Syria, but the fatigue is, is, is massive. So when I found out about the Syrian cyber war, and, and you know, when you say, how do we have ideas, I mean, maybe that's a bit, but I, I sort of think that if it really grabs my attention, and if, if I stay excited about an idea, if it's not just like an evening or two days, but if I stay excited about an idea over a period of time, it's really Really worth looking into and that happened with the cyber war I just felt that was a way of telling the Syrian war story that hadn't been told um, so so I look for that new I you know like can I turn it into a detective story but I think the formats is also experiencing experimenting with formats is you know the I don't know if you've seen the Haiti earthquake earthquake interactive project um, but that was looking at a natural disaster through it's, it's a really good project through the eyes of various characters um, and and you know maybe the floods which you know at least in your context everybody knows about maybe there's room to do something like that and uh, and, and and again in terms of thinking of formats so the project that we're building for Google the final outcome will be that so we have a story builder website where we enable the journalist to use their interview content to convert that into into chat so what the final outcome will be for the user similar to the Syria project that that you basically end up interacting with the different characters in the story so your people in the in the flood zone could, could uh, chat you know, with a victim, with somebody who's meant to manage it, with somebody who does, I don't know, illegal logging and causes it, um, and making it up. But pe kids love the immediacy of, and, and I urge everybody to say, and then it's definitely your turn, also look at stuff that isn't journalism. I got quite hooked on yes, Jessie Humani, which is this chatbot. Um, she's like, the girl you don't really want to be girlfriends with because she's really superficial, but it lives on Facebook Messenger, and I just found it really interesting kind of, you know, how, how, how they've done it. So I thought, can I use that for journalism? I, I just thought one, one, one quick thought is that, you know, in journalism, we're very focused on the new, what's new, what's, you know, what do you, what do you know? And, and I think what we've heard from some of these projects is, is about the emotional connection rather than the, the new information connection. And to, to that extent that you can build out that connection, I think that actually lasts a long time because, I mean, your project's been, you've had ex exhibitions going around for years now, and, uh, and, and that continues to live despite having no new information in it, right? I think it's a matter of approach, you know? Um, maybe you want to change something with this flooding coming every year. Maybe a dam should be built or something. And when you start then reporting on the dam, or on, on the solution of this problem, then you have a completely new angle you can work on for year, 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 and year after year, till it's solved. And then it's no story anymore. Other questions? Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm eating from Taiwan, and I have several questions for Juliana. And I really love your game when I first saw it in 2014, and it's really inspiring. So uh, the question I want to ask is that when it comes to gamification, people are thinking about having fun. So how do you balance the, like, make people want to play, and but also maintain it is a very serious story. And the second question is that uh, you talk about that you have the taste time because every game has to have the taste time. So how long you do for the taste? And do you change rules after you taste when you feel something is wrong? Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, the, the keeping it real, um, we, we kept going back to it. And one of the things that we, for example, do, like when you, when you meet the different characters that you chat to, for example, you access their real social media profiles. And, and we deliberately kept on bringing in reminders that, that, that it is real, because that was really important. I also tried to call it journalism in a game format instead of like a game, but like even in Al Jazeera, people never picked up on that change of language. So that's one. Secondly, user testing, um, again, having that relationship. Uh, I, I really 
love now, and um, I do it from the very beginning, the onset, and, um, and, and what really is the most useful user testing, if you just give something to somebody, and, and you say nothing, and you just sit back and observe. Um. Yeah, I, I would like to add one, one thought. Um, we just made in our newsroom a really big mistake um, on the title of a project. It was like everybody in the newsroom does, you know, you do a title to your project, publish it and forget about it. But this was very expensive, took a very long time to publish and we never tested the title. And I will never do it again. <laughs> you know, always test the title. What's the name of it? And test it with real users, otherwise you're screwed. Can I just... Oh yeah. Say the mistake, tell us the mistake. Yeah, it was a big book we um, produced um, over how the language could be teach better in schools. And the title was uh, Teachers, You Need to Learn How to Write. And so <laughs> no, every teacher in Germany is offended. They say, <laughs> okay, we will not buy the book, we will not read what it's about, and it's like, ah, big mistake. Impact. Can I know title? I have to say my title story as well. Because like when we started sending, I, I was really proud. We had a long brainstorm session about what's the URL for this project. It's SciHacked. It's SY for Syria and Hacked for Hacking. So we were all super happy with it and whatever. Until we started sending it around in the organization and nobody opened it because anybody who knew anything about hacking <laughs> figured that it was. And uh, apparently it really impacts on you know how, how much it get open. It, it was, well, anyway, we live with it. So um, user test everything. Uh, we've got time probably for one question more if there are any questions. And if there aren't, I've got a question. But uh, so, so as we, as we wind up, um, had lots of interesting lessons and, and thoughts. So what's the one, what's the single lesson you'd like people to, to walk away from this, um, from this session with about trying something new? Test your borders and not only test it, break it. There's no written rule in history that says to journalists, you need to do this or that. We are completely free to do whatever we want to do unless it's false. If it's false, it's forbidden. Okay, the rest is okay. Yeah, that's kind of really my thing as well. You know, I mean, look at it, take the journalism, take the essence of journalism, which is interviews, um, and, you know, what we all do, what we put in our films or, or, or our print, and, and, and do experiments with new formats. I mean, that kind of sounds, but it really is that. And, uh, and, and try and get it wrong and try again. And, and design the project in a way that you, you have time. I think this is also the lesson learned. It, at least with my project, I'm now convinced there will be failure at any given point, so I need to make time for that and to learn from mistakes. Mm -hmm.